Controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Rhino. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Welcome to Exploration Radio. I'm your host, Ahmad. Now, I was going to make a grandiose introduction about space and humanity's attempt in trying to explore it. But then, who could put it better than the godfather of public service science communication, Carl Sagan? The size and age of the cosmos are beyond ordinary human understanding. Lost somewhere between immensity and eternity is our tiny planetary home, the Earth. For the first time, we have the power to decide the fate of our planet and ourselves. This is a time of great danger, but our species is young and curious and brave. It shows much promise. In the last few millennia, we have made the most astonishing and unexpected discoveries about the cosmos and our place within it. I believe our future depends powerfully on how well we understand this cosmos in which we float like a mote of dust in the morning sky. The surface of the Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. On this shore, we've learned most of what we know. Recently, we've waded a little way out, maybe ankle deep, and the water seems inviting. Some part of our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return. Today's episode is all about our march towards exploring the final frontier, space. To me, Sagan's words really capture the feeling of what we're doing. The Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. We have waded ankle deep into this ocean, and it seems inviting. Inevitably, we will get there. In the same way explorers of the past, like Columbus, Chong Ha, and Ibn Battuta, conquered our world, there will be explorers that will conquer space. I cannot wait. I am Columbus, waiting on the shore, wondering what is on the other side of this ocean. Today we are joined by Matt Pearson and Garrett Olivier from Fleet Space. Come join us and let's explore. Welcome to Expression Radio. Today we're going to talk about a company that you guys are both involved in called Fleet Space. But before we get to the company and what you do, can we just do a quick introduction to yourself and a little bit about your background and essentially how you got to where you are right now? Sounds very good. Yeah. Hey, I'm Matt Pearson, co-founder and, and chief operating officer at Fleet Space Technologies. My co-founder Flavia is a, a rocket scientist. I'm not from the space industry, though. I started out as, a, as an entrepreneur in my early 20s. Uh, built a software company, and then really, I, my passion was always for for space and space exploration. So, I wanted to figure out how to build a business in um, that would do something meaningful in the new space industry that that's kind of taking off. I went looking for a co-founder first of all, someone with actual qualifications, and I had this goal in the beginning to to just learn the the space industry and look for the opportunities. And I thought that would take about five years. And I said, uh, within those five years, I need to figure out how this is all going to work. So I'm going to launch something in space in 12 months. And I don't care what it is. It could be a tennis ball. It really doesn't matter as long as like I just want to figure out how the, the industry, how easy it is, is it to actually get something into orbit. But met Flavia and we we founded a Fleet Together and uh, raised money with Blackbird Ventures out of Sydney. And we ended up launching Australia's first four commercial nano satellites. It took 36 months. Still haven't launched a tennis ball into, into orbit yet. But, uh, you know, now we're 3D printing satellites and doing all sorts of really cool stuff. So maybe a 3D printed tennis balls in the in the pipeline at some stage maybe a yeah. 3d printer into space that can print a tennis ball and then and then like there you go i like the yeah. way you think yeah <laughs> and, and any particular reason why you were interested in getting into kind of the space industry like wh- why a startup uh that had anything to do with space i see this as the the next it's just the next great leap in human progress you know and i think that um i like to think if uh in any of the the giant migrations that might have happened throughout human history if I was around for those, I would have been on the kind of 
just with the pack of people, with that tribe of people that are going, hey, we're going to go and, and find the next thing and, and head out and explore the new world. That's what I think is happening now. And so whatever I could do to be useful as part of that, I just, I wanted to be involved. I think there's a, it's a very big thing that's happening here. We, we make fun of it sometimes about, you know, making life multi-planetary and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it, it sounds very glib, but uh, I think it's true. You know, this is, this is a huge moment for humanity. And uh, I, I wanted to play a small part, at least. If we can play a bigger part, um, so much the better. And uh, yeah, like, so we have done these episodes, uh, like a few episodes on space exploration. And I guess one of the things that when we were kind of going through the through the process of putting them together, and we realized, you know, like, it would have been easier to go to the North Pole than it would have been to go to space. But now it seems to have flipped the other way, you know, like where it's actually more interest in trying to put people into space than to actually send them to kind of the far corners of the earth in, in some ways. Mm. Um, so, I, so I think that it's like the real kind of shift, I think, in technology and our ability and, and what we can do in space as well. And it's all kind of come, I think, to a nice kind of head now where... Uh, you know, it maybe gives people like yourself and your co-founders the, the chance to start a company like Fleet and, and kind of get it off the ground as well. Exactly. It's um, even though, you know, the moon and Mars are far less hospitable than uh, the North Pole or the South Pole for that matter, it's, it still has this, this great appeal. And um, I think, I mean, people have been dreaming about this for, for many hundreds of years. So, but, and now we do have a, a shot at it. And that was, I think the, the beginning of fleet was, was going all right for someone who's an outsider to the industry, uh, there is this, there's been this whole movement around using small satellites for um, commercial applications. They, you know, nano satellites have been around for a couple of decades and, and they've been used really effectively by universities to, to work on research projects. Um, but a few companies have started using them for commercial applications like Planet Labs. When we got started, we were looking at, at for applications in 2014 2015 and you know they had just launched a, a couple of satellites um their pathfinders around that time and uh, they're using that for earth observation the challenge was okay they're doing that for earth observation the big the the, the big game in in orbit is uh, uh typically communications so can you build a small satellite that can actually provide meaningful communications and if you can what would you do with it um all these are uh, big questions that we needed to solve so yeah so there was this, just this opportunity to go and um and that's that's really what got got us excited in the early days like we can there's this entry point around small satellites it doesn't it's not that expensive to launch something to orbit um and a lot of people are doing it the question then becomes what are you going to do and uh and where do you add value to the world Garrett, just to kind of round it off, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about who you are and how you got to what you're doing in Fleet as well? Sure, Amart. So my name is Garrett Olivier, and I'm the Director of Planetary Geophysics at Fleet Space Technologies. Um, I've been working in, mostly in the mining industry for the last 11 years. So um, originally, I studied theoretical physics at university. Um, and as, as I was writing my master's thesis, I, I decided to do an internship at a mining company that measures earthquakes in mines for safety purposes. I did it mostly because I wanted money at the time, but I did find that my skill set um, from physics was really applicable and it was quite satisfying to do something that was very applied as opposed to something that was very theoretical. And so uh, I ended up doing a PhD in seismology and geophysics um, while I was working for this company. And about five years ago, I started looking into the exploration industry in particular and using um, seismic methods for exploration. Because it ends up that um, seismic methods have been used quite a lot in the oil and gas industry, but um, not much in the seismic industry for various reasons. And one of the reasons ends up being that we need to image very small things over very large areas. And um, it's not very economical to do that with the, the way things are currently done. And um, that's why I guess I got involved with Fleet because um, Fleet has a network of satellites. They were interested in connecting remote devices and it ends up that um, remote exploration is one of these areas where if you are doing some edge processing and if you're collecting the right types of data, you could potentially speed up the way that we explore for minerals under, under the ground with seismic waves. 
So you're obviously now taking a piece of technology that was quite well understood in in both oil and gas and mining, but you know you're trying to put a different like a technological constraint on it. In that, like, yes, the technology that you're using is quite well understood uh, from a physics point of view and what it images and what it does. But you're now trying to do it on a piece of technology like nano satellites that that comes with its own kind of issues. Like you know you have to communicate to the satellite. You got to make sure they're doing what they need to do. Uh, you know, they need to send data back in real time. Do you want to talk a little bit about that aspect that has to change or had to get added in? Absolutely. And I think seismology has gone through a few of these technological advances. So for instance, the, the method ambient noise tomography was first conceived in the 1950s. And it took basically 50 years for computers to catch up to the point where we could do this processing on, on digital data. So even though the the concept and the theory behind it is very old, it took a very long time for us to be able to do this with uh, with digital data in the early 2000s. And even at that point, we were doing it at a crustal scale. So we were using stations that were spaced with tens of kilometers apart, like we have like the Geoscience Australia array, for instance. And what's been happening in the last 10 years has been the min- miniaturization of this equipment. So similar to smartphones, we we have very capable compact devices now that don't cost much money. So you can put out an array of hundreds of these devices for pretty low cost. And at the same time, computational power and um, storage costs have come down. So that we can actually now quite economically do this type of processing. The only downside was it still takes a long time. And a lot of it is because of the way that we typically do this. So typically you would put the instrument in the ground and you would collect data for weeks or even months. And then when you are finished, you would collect the data, harvest it and process it on your computer. And in between that, there's a lot of logistics. There's shipping devices with lithium ion batteries all over the world. Is um, You're working in remote places. So um, getting in and out takes a long time. And so the idea of now, again, using these compact devices, but enabling them with edge processing. So they act like a distributed computer in the field. And they also have remote telemetry. So the data is piped out immediately from the moment you put them in the ground. You can start generating a 3D image. We think this is really the step that's needed to take the method from, let's call it an academic method for lack of a better term, and to something that can actually do the same that airborne surveys have done for exploration in the past by scanning the subsurface rapidly. That's right. Yeah, like in the pre-interview, you and I talked about, yeah, like this episode that we did with like the Rover Boys, uh, yeah, like where there was this gentleman, you know, a geologist that was the last person that mapped, you know, like stuff on on land. And then there was the kind of the advent of seismic surveys offshore. And I remember looking at photos and, and yeah, like, like their, um, I guess, like seismographs were, yeah, like these cubicle sized buildings that had to be dragged, mm-hmm. like, you know, through the dirt and kilometers of cables and data acquisition trucks and yeah and all the data used to be on like the old kind of like you know magnetic tapes tapes and like you know that had to then like get shipped away and like yeah they would get too dusty and then you could lose data and all of that stuff and so there's all this kind of advancement that had to happen to get to a point where like you know effectively you now have a receiver that's you know, like for whatever intensive purpose i say miniaturized now to a point that it can actually work in a small small location so I think all of that kind of technological advancement had to kind of happen for you to kind of get to this point. But so one other thing I, I guess I kind of want to talk about is that when people talk about seismic data, maybe they're familiar with kind of the earthquake side, but can you mm-hmm. just talk about that, you know, there are like, particularly in our industry, we use different types of, of seismic data, you know, like active seismic, passive seismic, and then you're talking about uh, ambient noise kind of tomography. So they're all these kind of different, can you just give a quick kind of intro so like the layman person can kind of understand what are these, all these different types of data? So you're right, when the um, conventional listener would, listen, would, would hear the term seismic, they would often think about earthquakes. And that is basically why um, seismographs, modern seismographs were developed initially. It was to record, record earthquakes and to figure out where they're coming from and, and what their magnitudes were. Um, along the way, though, people found out that what we're recording is predominantly noise. More than 99.999% of the data we record is just background noise. Mm-hmm. Now, noise is probably quite a bad term for this because it's not electronic noise. It's not like the, the noise that you see on your TV when in the old days when you didn't have reception. These are actually seismic waves that are bouncing around all over the crust and sampling deep into the earth. Now, they're mostly generated at low frequencies by the an- interaction of the ocean and the, and the coast. So when the ocean wave, ocean swell comes in, it creates a pressure wave on the seafloor. 
And remarkably, you can record that almost everywhere on Earth. Even though it's really faint, these devices are so sensitive that you can record the incoming ocean swell anywhere. And at higher frequencies, it's dominated by a human activity. So, so a, mining, a mining operation, the crusher is a big source of noise, um, the, the haul trucks, um, traffic in cities, railways, these all cause faint vibrations that you can record everywhere on Earth. And when I mentioned in the 50s, um, some seismologists figured out that the noise you're recording actually contains useful information and you can actually exploit that information to image the subsurface. It seemed far out at the time and it took basically 50 years before someone showed that you could do it. And interestingly, the first person to show that you can do it compellingly was um, by using helioseismology, so imaging the internal structure of the sun by looking at ah, variations okay. or... Like the instrumentation had to get sensitive enough to be able to kind of discern, yeah, like what, what is actual true electronic noise or what mm. is actual, uh, like, you know, like background noise. Mm. And when we say background noise, you know, like it's kind of hard to sometimes explain, but it's kind of the concept that if you're standing out somewhere, like, you know, there's always kind of the sound of wind. Kind of, like, you know, there's, the wind always makes a sound. So, you know, like if it's a, obviously if it's a, a uh, tornado is going to make a lot of sound, but then, you know, mm. like a normal day, it's going to make a small amount of sound, but there's still that sound that you can kind of do something with. Absolutely. So the earth is always humming. So some people call this the background hum of the earth and the earth is always humming. Um, something that was quite interesting that happened during COVID though, is that we saw that at, for cities all over the world, the noise levels dropped dramatically during, during, um, during lockdowns. So the earth got a lot quieter because most of the cities around the world shut down. It was pretty interesting in places like um, San Francisco or San Francisco or Los Angeles that is quite seismically active as well. So it was a good time for earthquake seismologists because their background noise levels dropped a lot. And so can you talk about how the, you know, like the ambient noise aspect, you know, like obviously if I think about it, uh, you know, uh, without too much of a background, I would think that if it's hard to image that noise on the surface, you know, like how can you do it? Uh, kind of meaningfully uh, in space like you know that, I guess that would be the like the logical kind of extension mm -hmm. of this argument so on the moon um, it turns out that there's quite a lot of seismic noise um, it might sound strange because there's not an ocean on the moon and there's obviously not humans on the moon but the, uh, the moon gets bombarded with meteorites very frequently so thousands of micrometeorites hit the moon every day and also because the moon has Quite, quite different different properties to Earth. Um, there's a lack of water and water absorbs seismic energy on Earth. There's a lack of water on the moon and also the moon, the outer crust of the moon is really um, broken up by successive meteorite impacts. So the moon ends up being really scattering for lack of a better term in, in seismic world. So the moon is constantly bombarded with meteorites and also scatters this energy really quickly and effectively. So the moon has a very stable background hum it is lower than on Earth, so we need more sensitive instruments than we do on Earth, but it's always always happening and always there. So in some way, I mean, it's it's perfect. I didn't have to prompt you to take you there, but you kind of talked about it. You know, so one of the benefit of using things like, I guess, uh, AMT or ambient noise tomography is that it, it will likely work on other planets somewhat better. You know, so for like things like moon and, and say dusty planets that seem to get bombarded and don't have an atmosphere that burn things away like earth does you know that that ambient noise tomography will actually be a good technique to kind of go and understand those from afar anyways absolutely so the the insight instrument uh, the seismic instrument on mars that nasa launched um, in 2018 their seismology team has shown quite a lot of um, innovative ways how you can process noise on mars just with a single station so typically when we do these surveys, we want to have an array of stations. And actually what we're doing is we're re relying on seeing how the waves travel differently from one station to the next. And with that information, we can see what's going on in between the stations and at depth. But um, on Mars and on the moon, we don't have big dense arrays of seismic instruments yet. So we have to rely on these single station techniques. So that greatly limits our spatial resolution. We can't say much about what the composition of the regolith is um, laterally, but we can see vertically or in one dimensional uh, structure of the subsurface of the moon and Mars. And so this is, um, I mean, I guess this is something that we're going to talk about that when you talk about space, you know, like the biggest problem realistically in space, and, and Matt kind of mentioned this, is, you know, is, is getting stuff uh, into space. Yeah, like that, that tends to be a far amount of cost. 
But then when you're talking about trying to go onto other planets, yeah, like the the other part of that equation is that you got to make sure all of this stuff lands on that other planet without getting smashed up either. Like if you're trying to get instruments onto the surface of Mars, you know, that has an added complexity in that you got to make sure that it works a certain way. Whereas if you could do it through satellites, yeah, like once you get stuff into space, mm-hmm. yeah, there's only one kind of kind of challenge that you're facing in that in that space. But I think it's it's worth being clear, like we we do have devices on the ground. We're a communications satellite network. The tricky thing, especially, and this is what got us thinking about, okay, how do we change exploration on Earth? If how would we how do we do it better if we're going to explore at scale on other planets? It's about making small hardware that can be landed um, by you know a small um, some small landing craft talking up to satellites in in orbit and not a huge number of satellites not tens of thousands of satellites in orbit um and then sending that those signals back so that was that was really like making these these arrays that will be able to um scale up the the image that we're able to get back when you talk to nasa they say things like man we are really not going to be able to explore very far at all using rovers like it's traveling at 100 meters a day that's right you're just not going to traverse that that much territory right so so by using lots of low cost instruments um fanning them out over hundreds of square kilometers you can go okay we're going to take a a snapshot of the subsurface there um get all that data back over the satellite which is a pretty non traditional way to do things on earth right like you have to do it that way for mars but when we when we started talking to explorers right. on Earth about doing it, we thought like this could work for you too. They were like, "Really?" <laughs> so on our podcast, we're going to get someone that's going to talk about the Apollo, uh, yeah, like program that they did. And yeah, you know, one of the interesting things I remember when you kind of mentioned this, yeah, you know, like they actually mentioned, uh, you know, when you were talking to them and said, "Oh, what do you think was one of the biggest risks of the program?" And they just flatly said, "It's like, well, actually, the biggest risk was that we only had one lunar lander." Right. Mm-hmm. So, so if it fails, then, you know, that's it game over. Uh, like, yeah, people are going to go walk around like 50 meters around where we landed and that's it. Like, yeah, there's not going to be able to do anything uh, mm-hmm. outside. And so I think there's this kind of component now that, uh, you know, like instead of having just kind of one roll of the dice, like one thing has to work. If you have these low cost devices, you know, even if they have a 20, 30% fail rate, at least you're still, you know, like able to collect data because, you know, it's not just like, you know, they're getting no data back and then and that's kind of a failed experiment right there. Exactly. I think that's the modern approach now to, to just about everything, you know, really distributed systems, lots of low cost systems, especially as compute power has been miniaturized and, and has, has um, become cheaper. Uh, you can make you can have a whole lot of small, really smart devices that are low cost to, to manufacture, relatively low cost, of course. But uh, it it uh, it does, yeah. That that's definitely the modern approach, and that that's when we saw during Apollo that uh, you know there's a great photo of Buzz Aldrin on the lunar surface putting a passive seismic station down, and so that image really that's what triggered a lot of a lot of our questions about well, how now we're going back to the moon going to Mars, like, how are we going to do that experiment better from a kind of IoT approach and everything? And it would be a huge proliferation of sensors, not just one experiment, but lots and lots of of low-cost sensors. Probably for the that's, same price as one experiment, we could do a hundred, you know. So that's right. And I think your yeah, like your ability to maybe be a little bit more serendipitous about what you find as well, you know, increases because you're not so geared on just trying to find one thing. So one comment, I guess, follow up comment I have about what you're talking about is that one challenge that I guess companies like you have is that you really need to find a way to test your technology on this planet and then, and then really fine tune it before you throw it onto another planet. So one of the nice things I think about a lot of the mm-hmm. technology stuff that you're talking about is that it's actually allowing an industry to kind of utilize their, I guess, workflow in a different way by utilizing a different technology. And then the benefit of that is that you guys kind of get to beta test your technology before you really figure out how you could use it on another planet. That's it. I mean, I'm, I'm a businessman as well. So my thinking here was like, we don't just want to have a, a laboratory experiment or even a, a proof of concept here on earth and then say, okay, it's good enough. Um, I really wanted to do something that would have huge value on earth and, and would be massively applicable and would really change the way we thought about exploration and then if we do that and it's it's worth x on earth it's probably 10x on the moon and 100x on mars you know so but it needs to be worth a lot here and and be 
um, a really, really valuable game changer for, for industry, not just for experimenting on, on Earth. And and so so why mineral exploration? I mean, like, you know, why don't you, I, I, is that the only industry you're interested in? Do you do stuff in agriculture or any of these other kind of industries that will benefit as well? Yeah, I mean, we're building a, a communications constellation. So we're we're interested in lots of um, lots of problems, but we our approach has been like, let's look at the biggest challenges for the world and the, the big challenges for the world that are out in the middle of nowhere. So they need a satellite connection. Um, and they have the, the highest value problems basically to, to solve. And when we looked at that, you know, the, the, the things that really stand out are anything to do with the energy transition. There's a whole lot of new renewable energy coming onto grids. So connecting those grids is, is a, a really high value problem to solve, like um, getting visibility on all this new energy that's coming onto grids that were never built for two-way flow and they get overloaded and they cause bushfires and they do all sorts of terrible things. It sounds like a wonderful thing. Hey, we've got loads of renewable energy here in Adelaide in, in, in South Australia. We actually have, you know, most of the time we, we have more renewable energy than we know what to do with. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we're only behind Denmark in terms of the amount of renewables on, on our grid. So That's right. most days it's, uh, it's, it's renewables only, but that causes new problems. So so that's one thing that we, we got really excited about. And the other thing is uh, if you look at, kind of look at first principles here eat like yes there are all all these sorts of downstream problems that are being created but we are just not going to get to net zero without six times more critical minerals in production so we need 42 times the amount of lithium over the next two two decades we need you know three or four times the amount of copper so that's really fundamental it's it's one of those hard truths at the moment where Yes, we all want electric cars and and this wonderful net zero complete energy transition and the electrification of everything, but it just won't happen without a whole lot of metal that we've got to go and find um, pretty fast. And the techniques that we use right now are slow. They're, they're just yeah. it's just a slow approach. So how do we turbocharge the industry? And that that seemed to us like a really meaningful problem to to put um the considerable brain power of our physicists like like carrot and uh our uh, space engineers to turn our attention to to these problems seemed really worthwhile i might and i think it's also interesting we're at this crossroads where there's this huge societal demand for these minerals but at the same time we have we're starting to get um, significantly declining um, success rates in our exploration yeah. programs and mm-hmm. if you think about a little bit how we've been looking for something like copper over the last few thousand years, obviously most discoveries during the Bronze Ages were just from people noticing green rocks sticking out of the ground and figured out that it's copper. Mm-hmm. If you fast forward, if, say, a thousand years and say the last couple of centuries, most most deposits have been found kind of by accident. So even big mines that are still operational, like Bingham Canyon and Grassburg, they were more or less found by accident by farmers or loggers or someone finding these deposits. And then I think over the last few decades, we've seen this kind of proliferation of science-based uh, discoveries where soil sampling has kind of revealed deposits that's previously been hidden by a little bit of regolith and also geophysics. So uh, like um, discoveries say like uh, Olympic Dam and Carabatina have been fantastic ge- geophysical discoveries that have been made over the last few decades. But we're getting to the point now where the easy to find deposits or the ones that stick out at surface and the obvious geochemical and geophysical anomalies have probably all been tested or, or found, unless it's in some place that's really difficult to operate, of course, or for, for a very variety of reasons. So now we have to think how are we going to make the next discoveries and discoveries that are a few hundred meters under the ground with complex geology above them? And there seems to be two schools of thought in this. And one of it is that we have all the data we need, but we need to, to use different ways of processing this data. We can't see these anomalies clearly, so we have to use a lot of modeling and machine learning to, 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 to highlight where these um, deposits are. And I know you, you personally are quite interested in this as well. And then another school of thought is we need to collect new types of data and develop new types of instruments to to find these. I think most people probably think it's a combination of the two, but I know that nowadays we see a lot of um, data scientists and machine learning professionals trying to find the next deposit and, and they think that it's hidden in our data, but we just can't see it. 
this is a great kind of uh, like stream to kind of talk about because one of the questions I did have with you guys was like, you know, like what is your perception of mineral exploration? And I think you guys have done a great job of kind of summarizing it. Yeah, you know, like realistically, what you're talking about is exactly where we kind of sit. I mean, it's the reason I guess we have this podcast is because I, I think, yeah, you know, like we're kind of sitting at that uh, kind of inflection point where what a lot of what we have learned in this industry, particularly mineral exploration, I think has been largely prospecting skills that have been augmented with simple technology and you know, like airborne surveys and, and, and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, like now I think we're kind of getting into the space where it's not just a prospecting problem. It's kind of, yeah, you know, like a subsurface kind of search problem. And then it's going to require a different type of, I think, intellectual ability to kind of, uh, you know, kind of find these things. And I think your point is excellent in that is that there are these two kind of streams. Like, you know, some people say that we need better technology or, or newer technology, or we need uh, existing technology applied in a different way, or we need a skills change where we become a little bit more numerically oriented and more, you know, data science and machine learning and things like that. But I have no idea which one's going to win out. But eventually, you know that there has to be a different approach that will kind of come through at some point. So that's one of the things that really um, attracted us to the exploration industry as well is that seismic waves have been, or seismic methods have really been underutilized. And I mm -hmm. think one of the main reasons why airborne geophysics has been so successful is just by the sheer amount of ground you can cover and how quickly you can cover it. It's this fantastic first pass where you can cover thousands of square kilometers and reveal the obvious, the, yeah. the obvious anomalies. And same with really for, with geochemistry, you can you can take soil samples fairly quickly and over large areas and, and analyze these and show where they are. But now we are needing to make these discoveries that need this next step. And whether that's some other kind of ground geophysics, like the, the seismic ways that we are kind of proposing, or it needs um, more advanced data uh, analysis algorithms, it's definitely clear that we need to get that next step up or, or up the game a little bit. One of the things I guess I find really fascinating is if you look at oil and gas, you know, like when they went from a relatively a simple technical problem like working on ground to going offshore they're actually the amount of data sets they collected actually reduced they relied largely on seismic and they got better and better at interpreting seismic data sets and kind of putting all of that intellectual horsepower and better understanding the data that's coming out so you know so one of the things i guess i kind of think of is that as the problem becomes more complicated you can't increase the degrees of freedom by adding more data sets you know you got to find like one data set mm -hmm. and get really good at kind of interrogating and kind of understanding it so yeah so that's just my personal opinion on how mm -hmm. i think you know like you kind of yeah you know, like you can't have a complicated problem and then have these complicated degrees of freedom that you have to manage on the same side like you know that's just going to be a, a nightmare to kind of solve in any way in any meaningful way yeah i agree i think i think a, a big attraction um, to something like seismic is that the instrumentation doesn't, it can be quite simple. You know, you can do a lot of all that you know, edge processing and everything, but it's, it's a nice, simple um, collection method. It's and, and can all the, the work that we've done to miniaturize things and reduce power draw and all that kind of stuff. There's so much that goes around it, but it's nice to be dealing with something that is like, like Herod says is uh, w well understood and is a relatively simple sensor at, at base it's just mm -hmm. using it in new innovative ways you know so i guess like outside of your greatest application kind of mineral exploration you know like i guess on this planet i can understand why mineral exploration will be one of your biggest value adds do you think it's going to be the same when you kind of go uh onto other planets uh now that's really getting to the heart of it isn't it it's uh <laughs> it's a big question you know, i think there are two schools of thought there as well either um, mineral exploration on other planets is a complete waste of time and there will be no value at all in digging anything up there, certainly not exporting it back to Earth or doing anything like so maybe you could do a, a little bit of in situ resource utilization for anyone who's looking to go there or settle there, but that's it. But then how come every dystopian movie that we see, that's exactly what <laughs> happens? Isn't that what, what we're doing? Well, exactly. I'm a science fiction junkie. So, you know, I, I, I believe that probably there's, there's something in us that we know, we know what this looks like. You know, every time we've gone to a new part of the world, um, a lot of people back home have said, it's, uh, you know, what a waste of time. Why would you go out there to the middle of nowhere? Um, but they've discovered something that's uh, worth um, bringing back. And that pays for a whole lot more people to migrate and, and so on. So 
Right. Uh, yes, there are some very difficult uh, problems to solve around transport and all the, the costs have to come way down. Um, but I, I actually think that the more I think about it, the more I do believe that um, that uh, a mineral economy is going to play a very significant role in the backbone of any sort of spacefaring economy um, because well, it, it always log- has. <laughs> like it logically has to, right? I yeah. mean, like how, like, you know, like if you think about what our kind of society needs, even on a basic level, you know, like how are you going to get all of that stuff from here to wherever you want to go? You're going to have to find either something along the way or mm. at your destination. Like, you know, like logically you would think that that, that is probably the easiest way to start. Exactly. And as we always say, you're also going to want to, even when we talk about this a lot, really, that uh, you're going to have to pick the spot very carefully before you actually land people. So mm-hmm. you have to know a hell of a lot before you you pick your landing space, because it's going to be so much more difficult to move things around once once you're, you're down. So knowing where you've got rich resources, as every, every settlement in human history has, you know, rich resources, uh, plentiful, easy to access, um, shelter, um, all these things, water. And you have to have some scalability to them as well, right? Like you can't land and then two days later you have oh, completely out. destroyed the whole niche and then what are, <laughs> what are you going to do then? No, totally. So so I think um, all, all of that is, is uh, we can do a, a lot from, from orbit with remote sensing, but um, to really know, uh, we, we want to be good at maybe non-invasive techniques because drilling is is tough anywhere, but especially on other planets. But we, we really believe that you, you need to land something a, a bit a large array of things landed on the surface will tell you a lot about what you're what you're about to do and it's logical and it's uh and it's we all i think intrinsically understand that it's going to be very important to find resources if we if we're going to leave this rock and i think it is also uh being someone in this industry if you kind of think about the fact that you know we're on earth and you kind of take away the the civilized part of 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 this planet and you look at where the mining industry kind of works yeah you know, it wouldn't be very dissimilar to if you went to another planet right like we're going in kind of harsh environments you have to set up kind of a local call it outpost you know we call mm-hmm. it mine sites but call it outpost mm-hmm. yeah like you, you essentially have to do that and you have to kind of be somewhat self-sufficient in a lot of ways and mm-hmm. the only thing that we really rely on outside influence really particularly in australia is people you know mm-hmm. like everything else is kind of stays pretty pretty much locally yeah, i think it would be a pretty rough flying fly out schedule though yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah that's right i mean the, and the rosters would be brutal yeah like two years on one year off or yeah. something like that like yeah that'd be terrible <laughs> Um, but but yeah, like I guess the point of, you know, like is, and this is part of the reason why we were interested in this on this podcast is well, if you think about you know what we kind of do in the industry, aside from the fact that uh, like if even if you take like say the machinery, you know, aside from the fact that it might have to work in kind of a zero gravity environment or a different gravity environment or things like that, you know, like we're kind of dealing with the same kind of challenges. You know, they tend to be very dusty. You know, they tend to be too wet or not wet enough. You know, all of these kind of challenges. So mm-hmm. it it is a to some degree it's a natural progression for what we do in mining on this planet to actually go to to do it on another planet. And mm-hmm. I understand that there has to be like you know the the jump is the problem right now. But mm-hmm. once you kind of solve that, like yeah, there's a lot of things that are that are, could be adopted wholesale on onto the other side as well. Amart, something that's interesting too is if you think about you know I mentioned before that airborne geophysical surveys have been really accelerated exploration in the last few decades. On the moon, obviously, there's no atmosphere, so we can't really do airborne surveys unless it's from orbit. But we know like, the potential fields from orbit are really not useful for all mineral exploration. So there we would need to rely on something like tiny rovers or, or penetrators, basically lawn darts that are launched mm-hmm. from, from orbit and, and collect data. What's interesting, though, is that um, NASA recently flew or started flying their the helicopter um, Ingenuity on Mars. So this does mean that, you know, geophysical or airborne geophysical surveys on Mars are possible to some extent. Mm-hmm. But to be able to do that, we go through this process of miniaturizing our equipment anyway to be able to mm-hmm. do any kind of meaningful geophysics or discovery on the moon of Mars. That leads to something, you know, you say, oh, well, there are so many things that at the moment, the space industry is looking at the minerals industry going, well, what can we learn? How do we do this at scale? That's right. Um, how, how do we transfer those skills? But I'm, I'm actually quite excited about when you think about the problem from a, the Martian perspective first and go, well, how are we going to solve it there? And then you bring those things back, which is what we've done with, with Exosphere so far. At first blush, it would make no sense to do that 
this way on on earth but it's the only way to do it on mars Correct. but when you transplant it back into the minerals industry from the space and just exploration industry it actually is a complete game changer and i think that's that's true for exploration what i'm really excited about is obviously we're going to have to do a, a lot of things with with robotics um in space so I think you'll probably see things that we invent for um, uh, mineral extraction on Mars, waterless, you know, or very heavily automated, right. almost entirely automated. Those things will come back and uh, and you know be the the next giant wave in in um, extraction as well, which could be could look vastly different. I mean, we could we could move completely away from gigantic haul trucks and all sorts of massive equipment down to quite small equipment, but just lots of it. It could be something simple like yeah like we obviously uh like you know you'd mentioned whole trucks here like one of the classic things is we we use utilize this big machinery which actually uses a lot of diesel to run right but if you're relying on such a heavy e- e- energy source kind of machinery well you know on an environment where you know you're gonna have to mine water to kind of create that that energy source you know like maybe you're gonna actually realize that yeah you know we don't we don't need these things that are gonna guzzle this much kind of energy on a daily mm. basis so all of a sudden the whole kind of uh you know the setup has to kind of change in a lot of ways um yeah. but i but i love your point about the fact that you know like if you can approach the problem two ways you can kind of look at existing technology and go well how can we adapt it to kind of work uh uh, you know, like on other planets or other environments, or you can kind of go look at that environment and say, well, actually, what do we need to get rid of? And maybe that means we need to reinvent things and, and, and kind of approach the problem that way as well. Yeah, so it definitely goes both ways. One thing uh, that I find really interesting about the whole yeah, advent to to try to get to space is uh, that, it that you know, like there are people like yourselves, which, which maybe didn't have the most you know, like evolved pedigree in our industry, but you're kind of coming in from another point of view and saying, well, actually, you know, like uh, we would create machinery this way, which which can still do the job the same way, but the tool looks completely different. It's a combination of uh, fantastic PhD educated minds and blissful naivety. Um <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's yeah, you know, but I guess part of the, yeah, like to some degree, the the root of most innovation tends to be ignorance to some uh, degree as well, right? Or stubbornness to to some degree. You have to kind of accept that. Those are um, the two things that work in my favor most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, but yeah, like I, yeah, like I guess as as someone that's been in this industry quite a bit, I think one one thing I find is that you know, like because of the way. Like, you know, effectively, if you look at a mining operation now, um, you could go back and look at it in 19, like, you know, the early part of the 1900s, and it wouldn't look much different aside from the fact that it probably would have bigger trucks and probably more people uh, involved in it. And there, and there are definitely things like computers and things like that around. But, you know, but fundamentally, we haven't really changed the, the, uh, the actual workflow too much from that point. Uh, but now I think we're kind of getting to a point and, you know, kind of uh, you know, Garrett mentioned as well is that, you know, the way we have to explore, the way we have to extract, the way we have to um, uh, kind of take the product to market, you know, like all of these things are going to have to change in an environment where, you know, like our ability to explore for things is changing. Uh, you know, like maybe the the concept of ESG and you know, like what footprints we leave on the environment that has to change, mm-hmm. and then what people value uh, from a like a, you know whether the metal has any societal value or or it doesn't, or are we doing it for some you know intrinsic value or something like that? Mm-hmm. You know, like all of these things are going to kind of change the industry, I think, in the next little while. Um, on something else that um, that you had a really good podcast um, early on in your in your series about why the mining industry is cyclical. And I think one of the things we tend to neglect is what a detriment to innovation a cyclical in, in, industry is, because it really like disencourages techn- technological people to develop things. And s- same reason why it's kind of difficult for people to imagine studying ge- uh, like mining engineering, or it's hard to convince someone to study something if there's a bust, potentially a bust around the corner. And I- ideally, if, you know, if we were forward looking, we would spend a lot of money on innovation during bust cycles so that we're ready for the boom but in reality yep. obviously that's not how it works no and i think like yeah i think your point is really valid in that you know like like the old adage of like you know you get two boom years and and three bust years in a five-year mm-hmm. cycle you know all that really tells you is that uh you know over a 10-year period only four years are really worthwhile and the other six are kind of you know like pretty mm-hmm. downtrodden years so mm-hmm. so when people say oh, well how come you haven't done anything in t- 10 years it's like because we only worked 
like realistically mm. worked on it on that problem for four years out of the 10. That, like I, I think fundamentally that is something that's kind of like prevented a lot, a lot of innovation or development in this industry for a long time. And I wonder if that's going to be different now that we're at the beginning of this, you know, probably super cycle uh, around critical minerals. And, that's and, and and there's a lot of very direct touch points between technology companies and, and minerals companies now with, you know, Tesla getting directly involved with its, its you know, supply chain going, hey, we're going to get directly involved with the mining companies that are extracting lithium and nickel. Who knows? This might be a real golden age for exploration technology and, and extraction technology, just because there's such an urgent need, and it, we might see a, a longer sustained kind of boom, um, boom part of the cycle. I mean, you think, yeah, like the advent of like the end user and the producer getting closer would mean that there should be a lot more kind of synergy that comes from it. Yeah, it's not just like the producer just produces produce stuff and then, yeah, he doesn't really know what the hell the end user is using it for. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that, I, and I think you could just have to look at things like, you know, kind of the organic food movement, you know, like by bringing the ultimate consumer closer to the ultimate producer, it led to a to a whole change in how we buy eggs. Like, you know, no one buys caged eggs anymore because, you know, like people are like, yeah, you know, like I want to know if the, the, the eggs are cage free or, or whatever they are. So I think that like shift, I think will probably come to our kind of industry as well. I'm also hoping that uh, if the equal manufacturers themselves like Tesla and Ford, and if they get more involved in mining over the years, hopefully that will put the mining industry in a position where investors are much more likely to spend spend more money in, in, in exploration because their investments are a lot more um, diversified because it's not just investing in a money company. Effectively, they're investing, investing in an entire value chain, if you will. And I think, you know, like it's, it's interesting because we've done this episode on our, on our podcast where like, you know, maybe mining companies should become a lot more vertically integrated as well, mm-hmm. because, you know, that used to be the case. 3M used to be a mining company. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what like Minnesota Mining and Metals, that's what they were called for a long, long time. But yeah, but they don't know anything in that space right now. Uh, so they've obviously gone one way and obviously mining companies have gone another way. So one question I guess I do have about that kind of aspect is how do you guys find it as a startup, uh, I guess, talking to the industry? What type of reception do you get from the industry when you go and talk to them? Yeah, I think the the first thing is, um, you know, in, in the early days, we were just kind of knocking on the door saying, hey, you know, what would you do if you could connect all these things and you know, get the data back in real time? And, um, you know, would this be useful to you? And, and people would say, oh, well, interesting idea, theoretically possible, beyond the cutting edge, everyone wants it, but you know, no one, no one can actually do it. And that's, you know, being stubborn and naive enough to, to pursue something like that. Yeah, we, we thought, well, that sounds like a, a hard problem that, that might be worthwhile solving. So that in the early days, it was um, kind of like, that's nice kids, but um, that's, that's not possible. Let, let us do what we do. You go do whatever yeah, you, you want to do. Yeah, you just stay fine. in your lane, guys. It's, uh, it, but, but I think there, it was actually a little bit of curiosity and, uh, and going, hey, you know, if we team up with, with some space companies, that, that could be interesting and who knows where. Um, and actually, I think in the very early days, uh, we worked with some, some really um, innovative players in, in uh, the mining space that were just that not knowing where a collaboration would lead we're happy to jump in feet first and just go cool. And that very rarely works. <laughs> so I think it, was, it, it, but it paid off in, in this case. And then as, as time's gone on and we've got more proof under our belts, um, there's kind of the, the incredulity a little bit like that can't be true. This can't be real. Um, this this sounds like snake oil, um, which quickly gives way to, uh, you know, well, here's all the proof and this is what, how it works. And so people have been more and more open to, to run into proofs of concept. And now we've, we've even stopped doing proofs of concept because uh, we've done so many and uh, there's no, no real purpose to do anymore. And, and so we're kind of being embraced with open arms now. So it's amazing how, and that's all taken place in the course of about three years. I think it just comes from the demand in, in the market for, for some sort of innovation, but uh yeah, when you look at that, that feels quite fast. <laughs> so it's felt like many, many decades of work, but it, it compressed into three years. But it's uh, so it's, uh, it's actually pretty fast when you think about it. 
So what's your kind of, I guess your limitation right now? Uh, you know, like every startup has a limitation at some point, which you're hope, hopefully trying to, to solve. I guess what I find interesting about that is that, you know, the maybe the old adage would have been that if you're a startup, uh, you know, like stick to what you do best and then, you know, like an outsource everything else from, from that point. But what I find interesting is particularly, I think, again, like startups in your uh, industry or even uh, industries that are that are obviously more product driven, like you know, the, the, like their value add is really that they they can have this product out there a lot more, and then hence they can then extract that value. You know, they are all going kind of the the way the way that you guys are going, where you're wanting to actually vertically integrate as much as possible, so you're not impinged by the ability to grow at a rapid pace when you need to. Well, that that's it. So we started out being really clear on, hey, we. We're only going to do a couple of things and and buy in everything else. But yeah, that's given uh, that worked. <laughs> that that definitely worked. And then you've got to sw- switch gear pretty fast and go. Okay, yeah. now it's time uh, to do as much as possible, um, and so so that we can scale really fast. And especially now for s- controlling supply chain, you know, you just don't want to have too many gates for things to to pass through. So yeah. you can see why the some of the the greats in in the space industry are very clear that like, hey, they want to do everything under under one roof. Um, yep. You know, SpaceX does everything under in one big shed. Correct. Um, and allows them to bring in raw aluminium and um, take rockets out the other side. And um, the other point is we were kind of forced into being vertically integrated, in, at least in our mineral exploration solution as well, because simply the, the equipment to do this work in the way we're doing it doesn't exist. You can't buy it off the shelf. Ah, okay. Yep. So, that so that the, is the curse of being innovative to some degree. I think. <laughs> yeah. So so typically the instruments we used previously to do this type of work uh, were instruments that were designed for the oil and gas industry. So they were really mass produced and they were made really robust and quite cost effective for the active seismic oil and gas industry. And we were fortunate enough that we could piggyback somewhat on that technology to kind of do passive seismic service for mineral exploration. But unfortunately, you can't just stick a satellite modem on those and transmit data because you generate um, gigabytes of data per day on these devices. So we and, and the other part of this uh, is that these instruments are made to record quite energetic signals from from a from a vibrosized truck or from explosives. They're not really designed to record noise that's ten thousand times weaker than what we can feel with our with our hands. They're made to, for recording quite relatively strong signals. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, like this whole kind of like IoT thing, I find like really interesting because, you know, like a lot of instrumentation used to be, uh, it's like, you know, we need to store a lot of data because, uh, you know, like we can only access this thing once a week. So then the instrument has to have such a big like data bank, essentially. And then it's like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, if the data bank is this big, then the instrument has to be this big. And then all of a sudden, you know, like the whole IoT thing is kind of going, well, actually, you know, like we don't need to store like a week's worth of data. We we only need to store like 10 minutes because the other 10 minutes, it takes us 10 minutes to send the data out. So we just need to store it for 10 minutes. Absolutely. And that's also kind of a foundation where a lot of techno- other technology is built in, at the moment. And one thing that immediately comes to mind is um, smartphone or smartphones have something that's called a MEMS. It's called the, it's a microelectronic Micro, micro electromechanical system. It's effectively a seismic sensor or accelerometer in your smartphone. And it's mostly used for when you talk to your screen, it knows in what orientation it is. Correct. But, but these have become so good that they're actually now um, can monitor earthquakes and can monitor ambient noise by themselves. Wow. So, so people are using these very tiny um, MEMS chips to measure earthquakes and and that obviously will be a great benefit to the space industry as well, where we're using these very small but sensitive devices to measure um, earthquakes and vibrations on the moon and Mars. So you, so you guys don't have to create your uh, geodes or whatever geophones you talked about. You just have to get a smartphone in everyone's hand, and, you'll have, <laughs> and then you'll have seven billion of these things walking around, or seven and a half billion, or whatever it is. Now. Yeah. So and there's a reason why Google Google has a seismology department. So your your phone yeah. is actually recording earthquakes when it's when it's sitting on the table. Yeah, well, that, that's 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 really interesting. So, in the last kind of minutes that we have, we always ask our guests two questions, and I'll, and I'll pose both the questions, and you guys can decide who wants to answer. You can answer both of them, or you can choose which one you want to answer. So, one of the questions we guess ask is, uh, "What is something that you think needs to die in kind of like your industry?" So, since you kind of sit on 
like a number of industries. You can kind of take either the space industry or the mineral exploration industry or any other. What is something that you think needs to die? A behavior, a concept? Yeah, something that you think we need to jettison out? Well, from my perspective, I think historically we've been very focused on hiring specific disciplines that work in the mining industry. So it mining industry, mining engineers and uh, mining or geologists or mineral exploration geologists and I think two things have happened. Um, firstly, like we said, with the advent of new technologies and new methods, we're, we're needing a lot more data science and uh, computer science and uh, mathematics and physics approach to solving these problems. And secondly, another thing that's happened is we've seen uh, geoscience courses in universities kind of disappear. So a lot of much fewer, uh, very few universities nowadays offer, offer a geophysics or even exploration uh, geology courses. So I think we need to do th two things. We need to attract talent from other disciplines, and that would be the, the math and physics and, and computer science and applied math, and train them to work in the mining industry, and then also learn from how they do things. Fantastic point. Matt, Matt do you have one that you want to kind of contribute? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I I, I really think that um, to my, my, just my point a moment ago, uh, the thing that needs to change is we need to take the lesson from the medical industry, right? Like, so we, we have mm -hmm. to radically change the way we do things i think that's um that's clear and then the thing that i, I think is um that we sh that the minerals industry should keep doing is to stay on the the automation pathway that, that we've been on I, i've i hear a lot of geologists saying like oh well we've got these robotic systems now but they they don't really add much efficiency compared to a human and all that kind of stuff like it's it's a lot of skepticism about how valuable has has is automation in the industry but um but i think that 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 is a pathway that has to continue um and and we, we have to stay with that because uh, but not to replicate what we've done before you know you don't just want to emulate use a robot to emulate a human um, mm -hmm. and uh, say, okay, we've, we, we had a haul truck before, now we've got a robotic haul truck. Yep. Um, I think it, the, the opportunity is to go, let, let's go even further into the, the automation roadmap and say, all right, let's, um, let's take it to its, it, the, the nth degree. What, what is the logical conclusion for this? How, how radically would this actually change if you didn't feel you were constrained by trying to emulate the the human so i say staying on that path it's uh it's got a way to go but it's it's going to be the next great change for for the mining industry point that you make which is uh, yeah like the old kind of henry ford saying that you know if i asked my customers they, they said they said they would want a faster horse that's right and uh yeah and and that's <laughs> part of this kind of podcast when i was researching yeah like i found this like great uh article that that was an article about a discussion between I guess the early pioneers of the automobile industry and I guess some of the other kind of industrialists at the time. And there was one quote in there, which I absolutely love where, you know, this guy's like, you know, like cars, he's like, yeah, we don't need cars. Why would anyone ever want to travel faster than what a horse can do? <laughs> and yeah. And, then, and I love that thing because, you know, like, and, and yeah, people were like, uh, you know, the person that wrote the article was like, yeah, that's exactly what we are talking about. He's like, yeah, no one should have a need to travel faster than the horse. And it's, well, uh, and, and I think that's kind of how I think some people kind of approach this problem. They go like, you know, like, wow, we don't need to, like, yeah, we travel pretty fast on the horse. It's like, yeah, we have one horsepower. Why would we need 300? And it's like, well, actually you could do a lot more with 300 horsepower. So, and, and that's kind of the problem I think a lot of people are stuck in. That's it. And and when you look at the, the earliest cars, you know, they were essentially a carriage with a motor stuck on where the horses would be, you know, so right. it, it, it was, they were motorized carriages. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine that in the space of you know, another 20 years or whatever, the form factor would, would completely change and the speeds would be, um, yep. you know, tens of times faster. And like, it's, uh, I think we're at that same kind of point here we i mean we always are technology is always advancing but it's very hard to go well why would we why would we change our approach to to surveying for instance with with geophysics from one or two surveys a year in in isolated areas to just blanketing an entire tenement with uh, with equipment and just seeing the entire thing and getting all the data all at once that's a pretty big shift so yeah it i love the analogy 
Matt, I, I have to be a little bit upset here because you stole my thunder. Because the first question is, what is something that you think needs to die? The second question is, what is something that you think needs to be maintained in the industry? So you've already jumped the gun on that one. Uh, but Garrett, <laughs> do you have one? Do you, do, is there something that you think we need to kind of maintain, something that we shouldn't forget that's fundamental to, I guess, our DNA? Absolutely. I think um, the, my favorite part about used, working in the mineral exploration industry is the passion that the geologists and geophysicists have for the discipline. It's pretty uh, remarkable to be in a field where people are so passionate about rocks and so passionate about learning more about the subsurface. And you can, you can sense that whenever you work with them and you provide them new information about the subsurface, you can see this excitement on their faces and you can see that they're excited to learn more about the subsurface. So I think it's, it really attracts people who are very passionate about the subject matter. And I think that's quite rare. I think that's not something that's very common in the modern workplace. Yeah, you don't seem to find a lot of accountants that have that same level of, of, of passion, <laughs> uh, you know, like about, yeah, just in general no. terms anyways. My, my wife's an accountant and that's something we joke about quite frequently around the dinner table. Is she, she doesn't understand how I can be so passionate about, about 3D models and, and looking at 3D models around the dinner table when, and her job is so focused on micro uh, micro efficiencies and things like that. But I think it's a good point you make that, you know, like, I guess we shouldn't forget that part, right? Like, yeah, like there has to be this intrinsic kind of passion. And yeah, like even, you know, like someone like Matt, you can tell that, you know, like when you have this kind of like, a, like even a drive about trying to go and explore, you know, like you, it, it is that, that desire to understand or to, to evolve that leads to people, you know, jumping on a plane for three hours and sitting in a desert sucking dust for two weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's not something that a lot of people would willingly kind of, kind of do unless there was some intrinsic motivation that allowed you to get there and i think it's uh it really is that like in our profession we are the modern day explorers you know we are the robinson Robinson crusoes of the of the the world nowadays because we're looking to see what's below the surface and we're trying to map areas that no one no one can or will ever see and i think that's a fantastic uh, career to be in yeah and i think you know like we talk about space exploration yeah like one of the reasons why i guess we or particularly I was interested in doing, uh, like, you know, going back and looking at history, even the Apollo missions, is that, you know, it was really the modern day uh, kind of expedition, uh, right? Like, yeah, it's the same as, you know, Columbus sitting in the old world and about to go and discover the new world. Um, and so we shouldn't lose, like, like, you know, side of that, that I think that this kind of advent of space exploration that's coming, you know, we are really those you know, like explorers that we all kind of read about, you know, back in the day, like, you know, Magellan, Columbus, all of these guys, where we are really sitting at the precipice of the old world or the known world. And we're just about to kind of go off and kind of discover what what's the possibility, you know, ac- across the fence. Um, and I think, so, so, you know, so if you're not passionate about that, I think, you know, like this is really the modern day expedition we're going to do. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a time to be alive, you know, just at that, at that moment when the technology is ready, the spaceships are almost ready. Um, yeah. We're going, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's right. I mean, like life in another 20 years, like, you know, or whatever, like 25 years, 50 years may not look anything like what we had previously had over the last 25, 50 years, you know, mm-hmm. it will be completely different. I think it's incredibly interesting and, and exciting to kind of be involved in that in whichever way you can. Totally. And to, to go back to your analogy of the horse to the car, there was a, there's a great photo of New York. You, you've probably seen it where there are two photos so side by side where, and it's, I think they're separated by something like seven or eight years. The streets are just horses. There are horses everywhere. Right. And then the next one is all cars. And, you know, that's that leap that people could not imagine, but suddenly it was unrecognizable. So Correct. that's yeah, it's coming. I think that's a pretty good spot to end on. So, uh, so Matt, Garrett, thanks a lot for joining us. This is great. This is probably one of the most fun conversations we've had on this show. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. And thank you for having us. Thanks, thanks so much. It was great. Cheers, guys. This episode of Exploration Radio was brought to you by Ahmad Salim and Steve Beresford. Produced and edited by Sean Jeffrey and recorded remotely in August 2022. Exploration Radio is supported by the AIG, the One to One Group, and the Assay. And we are an official media partner of the 2022 PDAC conference. Until next time, let's keep exploring.